got a few surprises for you too, baby. Hi everybody, it's your girl Toffee T, also known as Toby Green Adeloo, and you are now watching Toby's TV Show. Woo 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 woo! It's episode two, and this episode I'm actually going to have somebody very special on as a guest today. I'm going to be interviewing them, and they are part of Black British history. Yes, Black British history, right? They mean a lot to me. They are almost like my adoptive family and um, they are so special. And I wanted them to be the very first um, episode that I would put out of actually interviewing people. So if you like this actual episode and you really fully enjoy it, remember to like, it's completely free, uh, subscribe and write a comment down below, share with friends of a friend, with your auntie, with your neighbour, and let's get it cracking. Go get yourself a cup of tea or wine, whatever you fancy. I'm halal, so I should be drinking water. <laughs> and enjoy. Hello, everybody. Welcome to Toby's TV show. And you can see that there's somebody pretty amazing sitting next to me. His name is Lee Lawrence. And I want you guys to kind of get to know him a bit. We've known each other for... I think five years yeah. five years guys um so do you want to introduce yourself what do you do where you're from my name is lee lawrence i'm the son of cherry gross who unfortunately was unlawfully shot by the metropolitan police back in 1985 which sparked the 1985 brixton uprisings i'm an author speaker social change advocate um, and I'm also the founder of the Cherry Girls Foundation and the director of Mobility Transport. And amazing. And I think that's how we met because of Mobility Taxis. So at the time, um, I was studying in university. Do you remember? Yep, yep. I was going to Kingston University and I really needed transport. I needed somebody um, or a company that I could trust and that I would feel comfortable taking me to and from university. It was quite a way, so it was about 30 miles from home till there, you know. And something that you guys may not know is that even though this this uh, happened to your mum, you did, wanted to do something good to bring give back to the, to the community, essentially. And I think um, in the black community, that is very, very rare. I think a lot of times disabled people are an afterthought and people don't really, I think not just in the black community, but because I'm black, I like to speak about that because it's something that is very close to home. And finding somewhere where I felt comfortable to express myself um, and have people who I knew genuinely cared about um, their job was really important to me. So um, when I started my final year at uni, I needed something that was consistent. Um, so that is kind of like how I ended up with Mobility Taxis, is stumbling across your company and finding amazing people like Gary, who we interviewed five years ago. So five years ago, I had my final project at university. And one day he was driving me to university and he said to me, you know, do you actually know the owner, Lee Lawrence? Like, do you know the story? Gary was telling me from A to Z, because like I said, the, the, the travel was at least 30 miles. So we had lots of conversation um, in between. He was explaining to me how much your mum was a fighter and that, you know, the Brixton uprising that most people know about, the, the history of the Brixton riots actually was because of Lee's mum. Right. And I didn't know that. I was so shocked and I couldn't believe it. And I thought, wow, this man, he sounds amazing. And he was explaining that with the money that was finally awarded to your family after years and years and years. And your mum, unfortunately, when you finally won the the um, the trial, essentially, that's when there was an award of money and that money you decided to put back into your community, which 
I think is so admirable. And he basically did it because his mum became disabled from brutality, police brutality, essentially, right? I think within the black community, we don't talk about that enough. And that's why I wanted this to be the first, first episode um, that I would interview somebody that I truly, that you're, basically your, your business is the ethos that I, I, the code that I run by. My moral compass is Lee Lawrence, is Cherry Gross, is, you know, that, because I feel like my disability and the things that I spoke about in the first episode that you guys should watch, um, I spoke about, you know, my mum having mental health Ill illness and stuff like that and she, how she wasn't really given um, support and help. And her mental health got worse because people like social services or the police didn't really do their job or their due diligence to make sure that, she was okay and the black community really do struggle with disability and mental health so can you tell me a little bit why you wanted to start mobility taxis because i could go on, on and talk but i really want you to sort of explain a little bit of how that started so first of all um one of the things i didn't say was uh, i define myself as a social entrepreneur which is somebody that uses business techniques to create social impact mm. and i would say in mobility transport encapsulates that now when that happened to my mom she was shot she survived and lived for 26 years in a wheelchair and I, I was 11 at the time witnessed what happened and became a carer so i saw firsthand the struggle mm. of someone living with disabilities Mum was the matriarch of our family, but she was a soldier. And she spent a year and a half in hospital, rehabilitating and trying to learn how to adapt whilst being in the position that she was in. When she came home, all she wanted to do was get back to being a mother, right? And for us as a family, we wanted to include her in everything that we was doing as much as we could. And that came, we were struggles. Mm. There were times when, you know, we want to take her to the theatre, we want to take her to a restaurant, or we want to take her to a family gathering. I'd have to go there, do a recce beforehand, bring her a wheelchair, and make sure that it fits in the door, make sure we know where we're going to sit. Because my objective was to make sure that that ran as smoothly as possible. Because if it didn't, that could put her off of wanting to, to go out for years, right? So that if we could make it smooth, for her, then it would encourage her for the next time to say, well, mum, look, see, we managed it. It was cool, it was fine. So we can do it again. And I remember the first time that I wanted her to attend an event mm -hmm. without me actually bringing her there was my wedding, right? So it was the, that was the biggest challenge for me. You know, it wasn't the venue or, you know, um, helping my wife pick her dress or, you know, thinking about who we're inviting. It was logistically, how am I going to get my mum to what was going to be one of the biggest days of my life, right? And, um, and I tried to find a company who specialised in transportation um, for people with disabilities. Couldn't find one. And in the end, I hired a black cab and I hired a carer, right? Black Cab allowed her to travel with, with dignity, so it wasn't obvious that she had a disability. They had ramps already within the, the vehicle, and the carer was there to, to assist her and be there for her without her feeling that she had to rely on family members that day and that everyone could just enjoy the day. Um, and after that, really, that was the seed that was planted. I thought, you know, how do I create that? That thing that didn't exist for me, how do I create that in a company? And that was really the birth of mobility transport, which was a mobility taxi at the time. And the, the ethos was around patience, care and dignity, right? Because it, it took a level of patience in terms of, you know, it's not a quick job. It can't be when someone gets in um, um, care. You know, you want to know if you're sending your loved one out with a company that there's, 
you know, these, these are people that genuinely care. And dignity, you know, treating that person like they're somebody and, and knowing that their dignity is upheld, right? Um, because that can be really difficult when you're in that position. So just to get it clear, was your mum alive at the time when you came up with the idea and it started or was it after she passed away? So the idea came up when she was alive, but by the time I launched the company, she had passed. Yeah, which is what I was told. And I wanted you to sort of share that with the audience watching because um, I think a lot of times there's actually somebody who used to work for your company. I don't want to say exactly who, but her son has sadly been attacked and now he's got a disability. I, I believe he was stabbed. Irony, right? right? <laughs> and so this is an uh, an occurring theme that I see within the black community and other low income communities that often people acquire disabilities because there is racism, right? There's, there's prejudice and there's people who do not care out there and who therefore put other people in arms way and their life and their family's lives are affected forever, right? And I think that, you know, I was born with my disability. However, I do know that my mom acquired her disability or her mental health because she wasn't getting the correct support and the correct guidance. And I had to be the carer for my mom at the tender age of like five, six, seven years old. I was reminding her to take her medications. I was making sure that she was safe and I was the one who had to section her. You know, I had to call at like seven or eight years old and get my mum sectioned. So these are traumas that the black community do go through. And when you become a police officer, if you're watching, if you do become a social worker and you happen to be watching this particular program, Toby's TV show is something that I want people to understand. that This is a social movement similar to what Lee just said. Um, it's really important that we think about low-income co communities and think about how we can help them. Um, I actually have somebody today on set who's like my, he's like my brother and he's Polish and his family went through their own traumas and I've physically seen that and they're a part of my life. Britain behaves as though that they are welcoming and they are open to all however that isn't the case and and it is a knock-on effect on the children and you know the the generations to come after that um but i have a few questions for you i've got them written down on my phone so i really wanted to get into that because i know me and you we could talk about this particular subject forever and ever and it's really important that people are aware of it and make sure you follow lee so cherrygross.org if you go to the website you can make a donation if you wish to or just register your interest to be um, a volunteer as well so we're looking for volunteers amazing all right so let's get into the questions i actually have a video that i want to show you and just remind you a little bit about it and i wanted to just get your reaction to it and see how you feel so here it is Back in 1985 which is 31 years ago um, my mum she was shot um, wrongfully shot by the police and as a result of that she ended up being paralyzed and confined to a wheelchair the shooting of Lee's mother, Cherry Gross, led to the 1985 Brixton riots. Lee was 11 years old at the time. So as soon as I could drive, I learned to drive. Then I became responsible for transporting my mum around. We were trying to do it in a normal standard car yeah. and we'd have to lift her out of her bed into her wheelchair, out of the wheelchair, wow. into the car back out of the car into the wheelchair. Sure. I felt if there was a company that specialised in this type of transportation, yeah, would they would have put my mind at ease. Yeah. Why not look at how you can create a service that other people can benefit from all that. Cherry Gross's legacy lives on through the Cherry Gross Foundation, which Lee set up in 2014. 
London Mayor Sadiq Khan recently announced that his goal for 2022 is to make 40% of London Underground Network step free. Until this process has been made, mobility taxis will continue to provide easy and safe transport for those with physical disabilities. How do you feel? <clears throat> wow. Um, one, uh, just even thinking about like what you me explaining why I set it up in the first place. Like I said it here and I said it there, you know, the can kind of the consistency of of how I tell that story, number one. Um, really took me back. It took me back because when I came into contact with you, you reminded me of my mum. And, and you know just to see you as this young black woman who had a disability but wasn't willing to let it stop her from pursuing their dreams or doing whatever you wanted to do. My mum's thing was to to carry on being a mum and trying to be the best mum that she could be. And and I never forget when I said to you, what do you want to do? Like ultimately, like what's the ultimate goal? What do you want to be? And you said, you know, I want to be the English version of Oprah, right? I want to be the first disability, the uh, first black woman with a disability to have like a mainstream TV program. Mm. So, no, oh, I'm gonna cry. <laughs> <laughs> to know that we had that conversation then, how many years ago, mm. and then now we're sitting on the sofa today. It's amazing. Yeah, it's a proud moment as well for me to be able to witness that too you know see you live out your dreams in that, in that respect so yeah so a lot of things were coming up for me in terms of what we were talking about and my connection to that and feeling a little bit emotional but also um, there was some joy in seeing certain things manifest mm -hmm. to manifest them yeah and after that i think we we then went on to raise some money at the o2 do you remember yes yes yeah yes, yes, i couldn't up. believe that you asked me to do that and um I, and at the time i was thinking wow this is like a big deal you know there was you know, about three thousand people at, at a concert and um you know it was a big ask to get to ask you to go on stage and, and then and kind of talk about your experience with us as the foundation and to encourage people to support others. Um, and you've done so well. I was so proud that day. You raised a good bit amount of money which went towards helping other people. Mm -hmm. So, um, yeah, that was another great moment. Yeah. Yeah, I just wanted to give people a bit of a timeline because, you know, I think you're not just i was saying in the intro that you you're like my family do you know what i mean and um one day i will write a book and that book is going to be something along the lines of strangers are my family because that is literally how i am here now and and how i've come to be and i think a lot of people are going to see the production of this particular show and think wow like she set the bar super high and the thing is is literally as you know like a few months ago i nearly passed away and all of that sort of stuff but i don't let a lot of things uh, um, bring me down for too long if, if I feel sad, I always bring myself up. And when you explained your mum and how your mum was, and also I, I did interview Gary. Um, I might show that to you in a second. And Gary was so proud that that was his job and that was his purpose. And you gave another black man, you know, a purpose, which is really important that we keep giving other people purposes. And so there's so many young people with disabilities that have actually emailed me, texted me and said, look, yo, I want to help. How do I help? And I said, I'm not there yet, but trust me when it's time, I'm going to call you and you, you, you know, you can be on sound or something like at the moment, I'm still building me, do you know what I mean? And um, I'm glad that 
it was you to come on the sofa first because I'm proud to know you. And if I meet other people, I'm like, yeah, I know him. He's cool. Like the, you know, and what he stands for is so dope. And um, I'm, I should have bought the book today, but I said, what I'll do is um, I'll show some pictures of me and you when um, we was at the book signing and stuff like that, you know, because I was so proud of you. And there was amazing people there for him on that particular night people from when you was a child if i'm not wrong that's right even my uh, my old school teacher my home teacher was there that day you know and, um, which meant a lot because that was the the only teacher who saw me and i felt showed any kind of real compassion around what happened so to see him there with his wife that day was you know it was a, it was a big moment as well so there was a lot of people like yourself as well who i felt you know, meant a lot to me and been a part of my journey. And um, and it was nice to just share this, that, that moment with, with these special people in my life. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. So, The Louder I Sing, yeah? What was the plan for that? And what, what are the plans for the future? So the book really was um, it's inspired by my story. And when, when I was 11 and witnessed um, that horrific moment where my mum was shot by by a member of the Metropolitan Police. In the immediate aftermath, the, the officer pointed his gun towards me and said, someone better shut this effing kid up. And for years, we, were, uh, we kind of suppressed our feelings around what happened. And it took us almost 31 years later to have what happened recognised, you know, as a real injustice and a wrongdoing by the police. So the book really is the 11 year old kid ha finally being able to have his voice heard through that book, basically. And it comes from a Lavi Sifri song called Something So Strong. Say that again. It comes from a, a, a Lavi Sifri song called Something So Strong. And the line before that is, the more you refuse to hear my voice, the louder I will sing. Amazing. Amazing. And are you going to write, like, future books? Or is there going to be a sequel? Is it going to be a movie? What's your plans? Um, so I've had all sorts of ideas around, you know, other books that are, or ideas for books that I, that I would like to write. So... Um, I do believe I'll do more in terms of writing. And at the moment, what I'm doing is still promoting the book and and what the book means. So one of the things we're doing, there's an edu education program called The Loud I Will Sing that we've got in, in secondary schools. And we did our first primary school recently also. And that is really to encourage young people to find their own authentic voice mm. and use it for, 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 for positive change going forward uh, in the same way that I was able to use my voice. So partly as a sort of um, the kind of work that we're doing as a result of writing the book and telling our story is, as I say, to try and inspire others and just kind of promote the idea around making sure that we, we use our voice and we stand up for ourselves. And that there's an alternative way to resolving your conflict as well. Mm -hmm. But sometimes, you know, automatically, it's easier to go to, to, to violence. You know, you hit me, I hit you back. But there's other ways, powerful ways that you can use your voice as a tool um, to fight back. And, you know, essentially that's what we were able to do. So when did you start the Louder I Sing program? So the, the actual program we launched on the back end of last year, we had our first school, Lil Lillian Bailey's, who have been so supportive. They've got a great head there, who's, who's really, um, Karen, who's really been backing us. She's one of our big advocates mm. for the program. And now we've been going into other schools. So the idea is, you know, we're starting in Lambeth and Suffolk. We want to reach as many secondary school and primary school um, as possible and then branch out into other boroughs after that but it's been so far it's been going so well and um 
I'm really proud of the young people that we've been coming into contact with. Mm-hmm. And it just goes to show, I mean, there's so much negativity around young people and violence and bad behaviour and so on and so forth. And we know some of that stuff happens, but, you know, what we're about is promoting the good that our young people are doing, right? And commending them for that as well. Because when you listen to, in, within the culture, when you listen to the music, you know, badness is promoted, right? Mm. And it's trendy. Yeah. There's a song that's literally just recently come out and it says, act bad, act bad. It's literally promoted to act bad, to do a madness. Um, and I think a lot of people, a lot of artists do feel conflicted um, when it's coming to music because they know that they are an influence and they don't know how to feel or change the way that they are doing things. And a lot of the good people within the music industry who try to do exactly what you're doing and go to schools um, are now sadly passed away and they're no longer here. So, you know, it's I'm really proud of you that you're continuing this legacy and I see you pass it on to your kids. And um, the last time I saw you was actually at the Cherry Grows uh, foundation statue so there's actually um, like a monument I would say in the middle of um, Brixton um, if you guys ever want to go and check it out you're more than welcome DM me or message me um, if you want to know a bit more I think every year you kind of go there again or, or is it just every so often? Yeah so we we, we want to make it an annual thing where we go there um, and we have a celebration uh, uh, and also that would be an opportunity for us to share all the work that we've been doing within the community as well. Uh, so that's that's so that's what we want to do. But we want to create more stuff around the memorial. But the memorial or monument, as you call it, right, is really a symbol of restorative justice, right? It's in memory of my mum and also the community who rose up for that terrible injustice. So it's to say, once upon a time, you know, this happened and this person existed. And what we build from that is to say, you know, although this thing was really terrible, you know, we found a way to get our voice heard. And now we're using that voice for change. Amazing. I'm so pleased. Okay, so my next question would be, this is super random. So what is your favorite old school artist and what is your favorite new school artist? Ooh. <laughs> so I would say, right, um, intuitively what comes up for me when I was when I was at school, public enemy. Right? Public enemy was, you know, at the time they were, you know when people use the word woke, right? They were wake, waking up people around, you know, being conscious about what was going on. And I just remember as a, as a young black boy growing up in the inner city, I felt empowered by hearing their music and they were speaking said as well. So that was quite um, transformative for me when I, when, when, I, when I heard public in me back in the day. All right, and new school? New school. Ooh. There must be some because you got two beautiful girls and a young <laughs> boy. You got yeah. you got to have a <laughs> tune out there that's doing bits. Uh, uh, uh. You know who I'm feeling at the moment as an artist is J Cole. J Cole. Yeah, okay. yeah, 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 yeah. I've been there's, there's a song that he's got. Um, uh, what's her name now? Uh, where he's writing a letter to okay. is it Summer Walker? Yeah, 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 yeah. Right. yeah. So, Jeez, all right. Give me a little spot. All right. So, um, I'm really inspired by that song. Yeah. All right. Yeah, See, I have to ask because, listen, I need to know if you're still with us. <laughs> <laughs> I need yeah. to know if he's still with us. But the us would be proud to know yeah. that he's still a little bit down. You know? <laughs> <laughs> We've got to do it. Do you know what I mean? It's a yeah. question that I have to be asked. The second question that I've got is when was the first time you recognised your inner strength? The day my mum was shot, although very traumatic and scary, um, there was a moment where I felt 
like I wanted to defend my mum. So although I was like screaming and shouting, I was saying the words like, what have you done to my mum? Like, it's like I wanted to attack this person. So there, I suppose there was this inner strength in me that felt like I could defend her. Like I really actually thought I was going to go for this person, right? Um, and then it dawned on me that you know, when he pointed his gun at me and, I, and, you know, there was kind of a reality check in the room, like, okay, wow, this thing is really serious and you could get shot yourself, right? But um, so I suppose it was in a very negative situation, but that kind of rage that I felt inside was almost like a bit of power too. Yeah, so I would say that's when I first became aware of, okay, you know, I've arrived, there's something in me, there's a mm. fire there. Later down in my life that I felt I, I understood that and understood how to then apply that in, mm. in, in a positive way. Okay, and in the future, who would you, is there someone that's famous that's out there right now that you'd want to work with? I called Van Jones in America, who does a lot of stuff around social justice, um, reform, you know, and he does it at a really high level, challenging the White House, and he's made a documentary as, as well around um, restorative justice, which is something that, you know, I have a big interest in, I advocate for restorative justice, and I've trained in it myself. So he's someone I've seen as like a trailblazer in America doing stuff that I would like to be able to do here. Right, we're going to make it happen. Okay. With Toby TV's network and thing, I thing, I thing, we're going to make it happen. Because this is only starting with me at the moment and the people that I know. But the point of it is to embolden and it to uh, enrich the people that I know. My next question is, what would you say to people that doubted you? Look at me now. <laughs> <laughs> hey, <laughs> come on. <laughs> uh, uh, to people who doubted me, um, what I would say is I understand. Mm. Right? And I do because life is tough and it can be rough. And we see probably more people failing than we do succeed. Oh, say that again. Oh, it's so true. It is so true, especially with in lower income backgrounds. We do, we see a lot of failure, but not a lot of success. It's so true. So there's a level of empathy that I have, you know, and I, and I say that meaning for people who have truly been, you know, maybe beaten down by the system and, 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 and actually do believe that you know, it's too much of a mammoth task for you to achieve what you're achieving. It comes from a place of, you know, their own ex lived experience. So I get that. Mm -hmm. not, not, I don't have the same level of sympathy for people that just don't want you to do well. You know, that's different, right? We'll talk about eight years. But for people that from that perspective. So I get it. And sometimes you have to prove, you have to, you have to be the example, right? To show people that it can be done, right? So, um, so, so what I would say is use me as an example, use me as a reference point, use you, Toby, as a reference point to say it can be done, we can achieve, we can overcome, right? It's not easy, right? And, and we know that, right? And as I said to you before, you know, it's easier to give up than to get up and keep going, right? We mm. know that, but um, but you know, believe in yourself, right? Find that thing in you because it's different for different people. What drives me, what gives me my fire, is, is different to what drives you and gives you your fire. But when you find that, then that is the thing that makes everything worth it, right? Mm. That's the thing that's gonna. You know, when, when you have fallen down, that's the thing that's going to get you back up again. You know, know that is, identify that and move from that space. Facts. What do you think the disabled community deserve? Um, 
true inclusion, right? To feel as included as everyone else, right? And it's like there's that um, image, right, of saying, it, you know, like there's a wall, right? And the tall person can see over the wall, but the, the person um, who's medium height, you know, they need a step. And then the other person needs a higher step. And it's just to allow everyone to be able to see, right, what, you know, from, a, from an equal point of view, right? So that's what I would say, true equality, true inclusion. That's what I think people with disabilities need. And I feel, um, I just want to say something. You see the, um, the Olympics that we had here? What they were very great at doing, doing was showing, showing people, people with disabilities, disabilities in a different way. way. So what, what we, we did then, then have, have a different level of appreciation for people with disabilities and understand that. They, they are super humanists. Right? Right? To be able, able to still, still do, do certain, certain things like, like what we're doing, doing now. Right? right? It, 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 it takes us a lot, lot more than, than what the average, average person, person has to connect to to make it happen. Right? So we need to also give, give more, more respect, respect to people with disabilities who are actually fighting their way through and still want, want to, to get, get on the line and do things and contribute to the world. world. And, and to, to be, be honest, honest, I feel um, people, people like, like yourself, um, what, what we, society misses out on so much richness when, when we don't include it. Right? <laughs> so, so for me, that's, that's what I want to be able to see. It really inclusive for everyone allowed to no i completely I resonate with everything that you've said and I couldn't have said it better. I think it's always good um, to include um, disabled people in the conversation mixed with able-bodied people who are family members or people who are around us because I think that they also have a really you know, big voice and there's so many people that I'm hopefully in the future going to have on the TV show um, that I can explain their side of things as well because I think they just don't get the opportunity to really say it as they get like five minutes on TV and then that's it they don't really get a full episode where people can kind of really understand them but for the Ashake it's he's like an um he's an African uh, Afrobeats artist and there was actually a stampede that recently happened and two people died and one person is currently still in critical condition um, do you think that the O2 Academy should, should continue to stay open and what do you think needs to really change if it does stay open um, so first of all um, you know thoughts go to the family of the people who, you know, yeah. the families who have lost their loved ones. How condolences. Condolences. And the person who's um, still in hospital at the moment, we pray that you have a... Yeah, inshallah. Recovery. So the first thing I'd say to that is, I feel like we should be informed by, the, by those who have been most affected. So and they should have a say in what they think should happen. And surprisingly enough, sometimes when you speak to the victims, um, they tend not to necessarily want what we think they want. Right? So I think it's, it's important to understand where they sit on it. Um, outside of that, I think there's an opportunity for learning uh, for if the academy was going to stay open, there's an opportunity for them to learn from this and to apply those lessons going forward to ensure that these things don't continue to happen. Because, you know, we need spaces and places for people to go and socialise and, you know, and, 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 and feel a part of. So I think they played a, a really big part in terms of having a really big venue for people to come and see artists. Um, 
So it would be sad for maybe a selfish point of view for them for, for to not have that opportunity again. However, um, I do understand that the importance of making sure that people are safe in those environments. Mm. Right? Because now I'm, I would be a little bit more um, kind of wary and anxious about sending my daughter or my daughters to these places knowing that that's something that could happen. So I need some reassurance that, you know, as a result of those things, that these are things now that are in place to ensure that, you know, the likelihood of that repeating itself again is, is lessened, you know, as a result of that. So that's that's kind of where I sit on. Yeah, I think that's that's a good angle to take it because I think, especially within Brixton, as we, we've literally just discussed throughout this whole entire um, interview, Brixton is quite literally the heart of South London, I would say. Um, most people, if we, if you was to say, oh, like to people who are from America or other countries, like where to sort of get some culture, some black culture and get enrichment, most people would say go to Brixton. There's loads of concerts or, or you know, lots of um, events and things like that. Even for the LGBTQ community, there's events that go on there. There's um, stuff for food um, and all kinds of amazing things. And, you know, a lot of the things have been removed and, like people say, gentrified. And so it's difficult sometimes to stand with people if we don't know really what how they feel as well like you said you know and what we should really do with a building such as that obviously i'd love to have you back again in the future um this will not be our final conversation i'd love you to bring maybe your kids next time or maybe your sister because there's lots of other people within this conversation that have a lot to say, or they're a part of the the um, programs that are going on, um, like your amazing daughters, who are very. I've seen them blossom from little children to like preteens now, you know. And I'm so proud of them and your son as well. Mr. Lee Lawrence, um, that's for Twitter and Instagram. Uh, I need to be better on social media. If I'm going to be honest, we all do. Don't worry. <laughs> it's it's all a work in progress. Yeah. Nobody is perfect on yeah. socials. It's not a natural uh, human thing to do. So just remember that. And also, you know, you're learning on the job. So be kinder to yourself. You're a beginner at this, and that's okay to be a beginner. I think a lot of us are thinking that we have to be perfect when that's just not the case. Um, slowly does it especially as as lower lower income backgrounds where we've come from remember where we've come from and where we are now if our past selves saw our future selves they would be extremely proud just remember that it was lovely to have you in the studio i'm so pleased that you came along and you agreed to this amazing interview wow. uh, Oh, well, <laughs> you might be scared, but who knows? Some people are a bit nervous to be on camera, but you can see this handsome man and how strong he is and all the things that he has to say. He's very smart, and that's why I give him all his flowers whilst he's alive. Thank you so much for coming. Thank you. Right, and as I said when we called, you just say the word and I'm there in the same way that I've called you in the past and you've been there, right? Thank you. Let me give you a hug, uh, man. Uh, mm. oh. Take it easy, yeah? <laughs> Bye, guys. <laughs> I got a few surprises for you too. All done. Ah. <sighs>